So we're now going to talk about Spring Boot's internal architecture. And this is where some of the material I'm going to cover here, I think is a little bit different than the videos you'll watch that Professor White has put together. So he, he, he has a very, very unique, very unique style of presenting. If you haven't watched the videos yet, I think you'll be um, amazed. He, he likes to write everything with a magic marker on a light board which is, is just the coolest thing. My, my handwriting is far too sloppy to, to do that. And I, I like to rely on slides. And I also like to make my slides available, which is my crutch. Uh, but he does an amazing job of using a light board. So what we're about to talk about here is gonna be kind of a little different take than what you'll see if you watch the videos he's produced. So we're gonna ta start by talking about the internal architecture of Spring Boot. And the architecture here is generally similar for web MVC and web flux. There, there are some slight differences because of the use of asynchronous processing for web flux, whereas web MVC is more synchronous in nature, but you'll, you'll get a feel for the overall approach. So internally, if you were to look deep in the bowels of Spring Boot, you'd see it leverages some very uh, venerable Java technology, things like servlets, which have been around for forever in the Java environment, Java ecosystem and also a whole bunch of uh, HTTP request and response processing. So the way this works, again, just kind of a little recap at a high level of what we talked about before, clients send HTTP requests, and I'm sure you all know that there's different types of requests. There's get requests and post requests and delete requests and, and put requests and so on. And so we're gonna focus primarily in this course on get and post, but you will see some of the assignments have some stuff that uses the other other types of, of requests as well. Once the requests show up at the, at the port number on the server, which you can configure through declarative means, through metadata in a properties file, we'll talk about that later, there's a dispatcher servlet that takes the HTTP request and the contents in the header and the body and so on and, and other things like the URL or URI that comes across and turns it into some internal data structure. And then that internal data structure is then forwarded, again, in deep in the bowels of the Spring Boot framework implementation to a handler. And so the, the handler, of course, is, is gonna be the, the piece of code that knows how to handle that type of request. And then the handler in turn will dispatch the request onto the associated controller. And this is, uses the, the RESTful approach. And so uh, you'll see that Spring, like, like most frameworks, uses a RESTful-based architecture. And this controller is then what, what you write. You're the one who defines the controller. So we just moved from infrastructure land that gets HTTP requests and converts them into data structures and hands them off to a handler. And then the handler is responsible for calling back the appropriate controller and, and you write the so-called endpoint methods that lurk in that controller. And now what typically happens, you don't have to do it this way, but we're definitely going to do it this way because I like this approach quite a bit. The REST controller really doesn't do very much of anything other than convert any HTTP oriented parameters into good old Java native style parameters and then make method calls on the service and or the model. And typically the way it works is that you call the service and then the service will call into the model as necessary in order to carry out the more persistence oriented tasks. So the controller really is there just kind of to bridge that gap between the message oriented world of HTTP and HTML and all that other good stuff and the world of method calls with parameters that we're accustomed to when programming normal quote, normal Java applications that are not web enabled. After the service is done with it doing its thing, the business logic portion then passes the response back to the controller and the controller typically then will arrange to take those native types and then convert them back into whatever HTTP related types are passed back and forth at the message messaging level. And that, that again is all typically done for you. There's sometimes you have to do a few things on your own, but usually that conversion process is handled automatically by the code that's, that's generated or the code that's used through the various reflection mechanisms that are baked into Spring. So 
the, the bulk of these interactions are performed by just good old Java method calls, thereby shielding you from these annoying distractions of having to do HTTP processing with request and response messages. Once the controller gets the return results that come back from the service and the model, it then takes those responses, packages them up and passes them back to the dispatcher. And then the dispatcher converts the response into an HTTP response. So it takes whatever internal format it uses and puts them into typically text-oriented HTTP responses. And then it sends those back to the client. And in this particular model, the, the client is typically providing the view. It's the piece that's going to provide the visualization and the interface, the user facing portions of the application. And then the server portion provides kind of the model, which is the persistence part. And the controller, which we can see there is the part that's kind of orchestrating the interaction between the HTTP messages and calls on Java clients, or sorry, on Java methods. So that's the end of the overview of Spring Boot's internal architecture. We will dive into this in more detail when we get into the specifics of Spring MVC and Spring Webflux. We'll cover Spring MVC very briefly here and then talk about Spring Webflux later in the course.